Hi, today we're going to be learning about using flow diagrams to represent functions. First, let's talk about what flow diagrams are. In maths, flow diagrams are used to represent or show how input values are changed to output values based on a certain rule or function. Now, you may have seen flow diagrams that looked similar to this. Okay, so over here I've got two examples of a flow diagram that it's the same, di the same function that's being used. It's just two different ways of representing it. You may have seen it one or both of these ways. So over here you've got your input values, one, two, and three. And here's the rule. This is what's going to be done to those input values. So if I take the one, I times it by, two, by three, and I add two, I get five. So this is my output over here. For, the, for this input, that is my output. Then for this input over here, if I take two times by three, I get six plus two is eight. There's my output over there. Three times three is nine plus two is 11. So there's my output over there. So this flow diagram is telling me these are my inputs. I take those input values, I apply the rule that's in the middle here, and it spits out these output values over here. Now this one over here is actually exactly the same. It's just been written a little bit differently where you have the different things that are happening um, separate. It's shown in separate boxes, okay? But it, it's exactly the same thing in terms of actually what the function is that's happening. Okay, now we are going to be learning how to write it in a slightly different way from now on. And that is like this over here. We are going to be writing our rule in the form of an equation. Okay, now in our equation, it's the exact same thing that was happening over here, that we were taking our input value, multiplying it by three, and then adding two. In this case over here, it's been written like this, where I have y, which is my output. So over here, my output values are my y values. So y is my output equals three times x, which is my input values, plus two. So my input values can be whatever I have on this side over here. I replace the x with those, I times it by three, and I add two. That'll give me my y value, which is the output over here. Okay, now this may look familiar to you or similar to what we were just doing in our pattern section. In patterns, it would have been something like tn equals 3n plus 2. Okay, when we are doing functions, it is actually very similar to what we were doing when we were working with patterns. The only major difference is that for patterns, we couldn't have negative inputs and we couldn't have fraction inputs, whereas with functions we can. So my input values can be negative numbers and they can be fractions, okay? And there's no rule against that. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Whereas with patterns, you can't really have a negative term, a negative number term or a negative number of terms. You couldn't really have a fraction or for a term number because the term number is what number, it, uh, the position in the pattern. So um, your inputs or your term numbers couldn't really be negative or fractions, but for functions over here, we can. So we are going to be working with negative inputs as well as positive inputs um, when we're doing this function section. We also can work with fractions, although we're not going to be doing that yet because we haven't learned fractions yet this term, this year. Okay, but once we have done fractions, then you'll be able to use fractions as inputs as well. Okay, so this is the kind of idea of what we're going to be looking at now. So before we go on to actually doing an example, I want to just show you what you need to do if you are trying to work out an output value, how you actually are going to do that. So let's take this example over here and um, say I wanted to work out the output value for my first input. So if my equation is y equals 3x plus 2 and I want to work out what my output value is for the input value of 1. I'll have y equals 3, 1, plus 2. Okay, that's what it looks like over here. I have 3x. But this makes it look like 31. So I can't do that. I have to put it in brackets. So this is something we need to get used to doing. It's something that I was already doing when we were working in the pattern section. I just didn't bring your attention to it. Okay, this is called substitution. Okay, so substitution is swapping out or replacing one thing with another. So what we're going to be doing, if we want to find a Y value or an output value for a given input value, what we need to do is we need to substitute the given input value into that equation. So we're going to replace X 
with the given input value. Okay, now like over here, I couldn't just write the one. I had to put it in brackets, otherwise it looks like 31. So I have to put it in brackets. Okay, so we have to put that in brackets. And then we use bed mass to simplify. Okay, so once I've got that, I would then say, okay, so 3 times 1 is 3, plus 2 gives me 5. So that's how I get my output value of 5. So I have to use bed mass, which means that anything that's in brackets goes first, then exponents, then division and multiplication, and then only at the end, addition and subtraction. Okay, so we're going to use substitution. If I wanted to work out my x value and I had my y value, so if I was taking, say, if I know that my output value is 8, equals 3 times x plus 2. I want to now know what this input value is. I don't have to put that in brackets because there's nothing else here. There's nothing that it can't be confused. The 8 can't be confused into being anything else. There isn't anything else it could be. So because there's nothing else here, I don't have to put it in brackets. But I recommend always putting in brackets when you are replacing the x or the input variable. Now just also so that you're aware, the variables we're using over here are x and y. They are not the only variables that can come up when you're working with functions. You can use other variables as well. x and y are the most common, but they're not the only variables you can use. Okay, so in the examples we're going to be doing today, we're going to be using other variables as well, just so you can get used to and be aware that you can use other variables when you're working with functions as well. It doesn't have to only be x and y, but they are the most common. Okay, so let's go on to an example that we're going to work on together first. So in this example, we have got a flow diagram and uh, we've got in the middle a rule y equals 7x minus 3 and we've been given certain input values. We have to work out the output values. We've also been given a couple of output values that we have to work out the input values for. Okay, so first we're going to work out a. So using my rule of y equals 7x minus 3, I am going to take the input value of minus 5 and work out the output value first. Okay, so over here, for A, I've got Y equals 7 times X, is, which is negative 5, minus 3. Okay, so 7 times negative 5 is negative. Remember, a positive times a negative is negative. So negative 35 minus 3 gives me negative 38. So for A, my output value is negative 38. B, now my input is negative 2. So I've got Y equals 7 times negative 2 minus 3. That gives me negative 14 minus 3 is negative 17. So for B, my output value is negative 17. For C, now it's a little bit different. This time I've been given the output. So I'm going to replacing Y with 4. And I need to work out what x is. So I've got equals 7x minus 3. Okay, so now for this one, I first need to see, well, if 7 times something minus 3 is 4, what would this have been before I minus the 3? It would have been 7 before I minus the 3. So 7 times something would have to give me 7. So 7 times what is 7? 7 times 1 is 7. That means that x must be 1. And we can check it. We can say, okay, so now let's see if x is 1, do I get 4? So 7 times 1 is 7, minus 3 is 4. So yes, that works. Okay, question D. Now we've got an input value of 3. So y equals 7 times 3 minus 3 is 21 minus 3. That gives me 18. And then the last one, E, Again, in this one, I have to work out an output value or an input value for a given output value. So I have been given 67. And I'm going to solve and work out what X is, what my input is. Okay, so I need to find out what X is over here. So again, I need to see, well, 7 times something minus 3 is 67. So what would this have been before I minus the 3? It would have been 70. So 7 times what is 70? 7 times 10 is 70, so 
x must be 10. And again, we can check it. We can see, okay, so if x is 10, do I get 67? So, so uh, 7 times 10 is 70, minus 3 does give me 67. So you can check yourself. Once you have worked it out, you can check yourself. And so those are the values that I should have got for A, B, C, D, and E in that flow diagram. Okay, so now I'm going to give you one that you're going to work on for yourself. In this one, I'm going to give you three minutes to do it. And you need to find these output values over here, the first two and the fourth one over there. And then you've been given 6 and 11, you have to find the input values for that. So I'm going to give you three minutes to work on this flow diagram. Okay, so let's see how you did with that example. So first of all, our rule in this example is 7 equals y equals x plus, six, x plus 6. And we need to work out our first output is where our input is negative 10. Okay, so I've got y equals x plus 6. Now in this case, the x is on its own. It's not being multiplied by anything. It's not being squared or anything. So we can actually leave out the brackets in an example like this where the x is sitting completely on its own over here, except for plusing and minusing and the equal sign. It's not being multiplied by anything. And so we can actually leave out the brackets in this one. You can put the brackets in if it makes you feel more confident. You can put the brackets in and then remove them, but it's not going to make any difference if you don't put the brackets in. Okay. As soon as you have your multiplication or division, or if you have squaring or anything like that, then you have to have uh, the brackets there. Okay. So in this case, I've got negative 10 plus 6. Okay. So what is negative 10 plus 6? That is negative 
4. So for this one, because the rule is so simple, we could actually just do it straight away in our, put our answers in straight away. Okay, so for this one, if my input is negative 10, my output is going to be negative 4. Okay. So over there. Then the next one, if my input is negative 3, then that means I have negative 3 plus 6, and that gives me 3. Now the next one, I've been given the output value. So I know that whatever I had for x must be added to 6, and I must end up with 6. So what plus 6 is 6? 0 plus 6 is 6. So your input over here should have been 0. Then for this one over here, my input is 2, so it's 2 plus 6, and that gives me 8. And then for the last one, my output is 11. So I have to have something plus 6. Something plus 6 has to give me 11. So what plus 6 is 11? 5 plus 6 is 11. So my input for that one is 5. Okay, so that's what you should have got for those. So I have negative 10 plus 6 is negative 4. Negative 3 plus 6 is 3. 0 plus 6 is 6. 2 plus 6 is 8. And 5 plus 6 is 11. Right, next example. Here you've got the rule q equals 2p plus 3. Now you see, remember I said, you don't have to only have x and y as your variables in your equation. You can have other letters as well. So in this case, q is the variable for my output. So these are my q values over here. P is the variable for my input, so these are my P values over here. Okay, but the way you're going to do it is going to be exactly the same as it was if it was X and Y. Okay, so now I'm going to give you three minutes again to work out the missing input and output values for this flow diagram.
Okay, so let's go through that flow diagram. So in this case, our rule is a bit more complicated, so we need to use to actually show the calculations for all of these to actually show the substitution that we're going to be doing. So for the first one, I've got an input of negative eight. And we need to go and find out what the output is for that example. So for the, or for that input. So I've got Q equals two times negative eight plus three. So first I need to simplify two times negative eight and that's negative 16 plus three gives me negative 13. So my Q value or my output value, if my input is negative eight, my output is negative 13. Okay. Okay, next one. My input is negative three. I need to find, I need to find my output. Okay, so if Q is equal to two times negative three plus three, let's see what we get. So two times negative three is negative six plus three gives me negative three. So if my input is negative three, my output is also negative three. Okay, next one. If my input is three, we have two times three plus three. That gives me six plus three, which is nine. So if my input is three, my output is nine. Then the last two over here, you've been given the outputs and you have to work out the input. Okay, so for the first one of those, I've got an output of 15. So 15 equals 2p plus 3. And we have to work out what p is. Okay, so 2 times something plus 3 is 15. So what was 15 before I added the 3? It would have been 12. So 2 times what is 12? 2 times 6 is 12. So p must be 6. So now let's check it quickly. 2 times 6 is 12 plus 3 is 15 so that works okay so if my input is 6 then my output will be 15 and then the last one I have an output of 23 and I need to work out what p is so 23 equals 2p plus 3 I need to work out what p is so again 2 times something plus 3 must give me 23. So what was 23 before I added the three? It would have been 20. Two times what is 20? So P must be 10 because two times 10 is 20 plus three gives me 23. Okay, so if my output is 23, my input must have been 10. So that's what you should have got for each of those values in that flow diagram. You should have got negative 13, negative three, negative 13, negative 3, and then 9, and then output input values of 6 and 10 over there. Okay, now you're going to do another one, or now we're going to be learning about finding rules rather. Okay, so in the ones we've done so far, you've been given the rule and you just had to use that rule to work out input or output values. Now, in this example, we have to work out the rule. Now, you did learn how to work out rules when we were doing patterns, but it's going to be a little bit different now because when we were doing patterns, the terms were consecutive. That means that they followed on from each other. We had the first term, the second term, the third term, and we were able to use those to find out what the rule was. But in this case, I don't have the first term, second term, and third term. I have got an input of negative two, an input of, of one, an input of five, and I need to try and find my rule using these inputs and these outputs. Okay. So we can't really use the same method that we were able to use for patterns. So now let's have a look at what we can do. We can look at the input and the output and see, is there the same thing happening every time from each input to each corresponding output? Okay, so let's have a look at how we get from one input to the corresponding output and then the next one and the next one. Okay, so first of all, I have got an input of negative 2 and an output of negative 10 and I want to know how can I get from here to there. Okay, there are two ways 
two simple ways that I can get there. There are other ways as well, but let's look at the simple ways first and see if we can find something that matches with the simple ways. Okay, so from negative 2 to negative 10, I can either subtract 8 or I can multiply by 5. Either one of those will get me from there to there. If I take two, negative 2 and I subtract 8, I will get negative 10. If I take negative 2 and I times by 5, I will also get negative 10. So both of those will work to go from negative, 10, negative 2 to negative 10. Now let's have a look at how we get from 1 to 5. The next set of input and output values. Okay. So again, let's look at the simple ways of getting from the one to the other. Is there something that is constant, that is the same as what I had in the first one? So I can either add 4 or I can multiply by 5. And now let's have a look at the, the third set of values. I've got 5 as an input and I've got 25 as an output. Okay. So to get from 5 to 25, I can either add 20 or I can multiply by 5. Now you should have seen already that there is something that is constant here. For each of these sets, I can multiply by 5. That means that this is the common method for all of the inputs and outputs. So this is going to be where my rule is going to come from, that I must take my input multiply it by 5 and that will give me my output. So now my rule is going to be based on that. Now I need to make sure that I use the correct variables. So in my flow diagram over here, I've got over there for my input values x and for my output values y. So that's telling me that my equation is going to be using x and y, where x is my input, y is my output. So it's going to be y equals something with x, okay? So now let's go and write that as a rule. So over here, y equals something with x. Now what did I have to do to my input, which is x, to get my output, which is y? I had to multiply by 5. So it's x times 5. And how are we going to write that? We're going to write it like this. So therefore y is equal to 5 x. We put the number first, the variable second, and we don't need to put a time sign in between because that is the standard way of writing when we are working with numbers and letters. When there's multiplication, we don't have to write the time sign. Okay, so our rule is y equals 5x. So that's what we should have over here. y, y equals 5x. Okay, so that is what we get for our rule. Now we need to use that rule to work out C and B. First, we're going to work out B over here. We've been given our input value of 6. We have to work out what our output value will be for B over there. Okay, so over here, if my input is 6, then it's going to be Y equals 5 times 6, and that gives me 30. So my output value over here, my B over here is going to be 30. And then for the last one, I've been told that the output or the Y value is 45. I need to work out what C, what is the input for that, which is question C. Okay, so over here, I've got, so this was A. This is B. Now we're doing C. We have to work out if the output is 45, our input is going to be 5 times our input, which is X. We have to work out what that input is. So 5 times what will give me 45. 5 times 9 gives me 45. So that means that X must be 9. So this over here is going to be 9. Okay, so that's what we should have for all the values in that table. Our rule is y equals 5x. We found that by looking at the different ones that I was given, the input and the output for, and I looked to see what was a common method that was used for each pair of input and output values. 
Then I used that rule to find out what the output was for the input that I was given here. And I used the rule to find out what the input was for the output that I was given over here. Okay. So now I'm going to give you one that you're going to work on for yourself. So in this example, you have to again find the rule. You've been given these input values and these output values. You need to use those to find your rule. And then once you've found the rule, you need to find out what is the output value for this input. And you have to find out what is the input value for this output. Okay, I'm going to give you three minutes to work on this. Okay, so let's see what you got for that for that flow diagram. So first of all, we need to find our rule. Okay, so over here I've got my input and output values that were given. How do we get from negative 7 to negative 3? Okay, so to get from negative 7 to negative 3, I can add 4. Or I can divide by 7 and times by 3. Okay, that's going to be a bit complicated. Here, to get from negative 1 to 3, I can add 4, or I can times by negative 3. To get from 2 to 6, I can add 4, or I can times by 3. Okay, now the only one that is constant, that is the same every time, is the option of adding 4 to my input. If I add 4 to my input, it will give me my output every single time. Okay, so my rule is going to be y equals x plus 4. My output is the result of taking my input and adding 4. Every single time I added 4 to my input. Okay, so that's what you should have got 
for your rule over here. Okay, so that's what you should get for your rule over there. Now, let's use that rule to help us to work out our output value if our input is 5. Okay, so now again, this is a nice simple one. So I'm just going to put the value in straight away. So if I have 5, I'm going to add 4 and I should get 9. So your output value with input of 5, your output value should be 9. If your output is 18, what was your input? What do I have to add 4 to to get 18? I have to add 4 to, eight, to 14 to get 18. So 14 plus 4 gives me 18. So that's what you should have got for those values in this flow diagram here. Your rule is y equals x plus 4. Then this missing output was 9. Your y value over here was 9. And your x value over here was 14. Okay, now you're going to do one more where you again need to find out the rule that's missing for the input and output values that you've been given and you have to find this missing output and this missing input. So I'm going to give you three minutes again to work on this last one. Okay, let's go through that and see what you got. So first of all, let's find our rule. So over here, I've got my inputs of negative five, negative two, and negative one with their corresponding outputs of 15, six, and negative three. Okay, so first of all, to get from negative five to 15, I can either add 20 or I can multiply by negative three, okay? Then to get from negative 2 to 6, I can either add 8 or I can multiply by negative 3. 
to get from 1 to negative 3, I can either subtract 4 or I can multiply by negative 3. Now, you should have seen that there was a constant method over here, or a common method rather, of multiplying by negative 3 each time. Okay, so that is going to be where our rule is going to come from. So our rule is going to be our output is equal to our input multiplied by 3. So now let's have a look quickly at that flow diagram again and see. So over here, my input is A and my output is B. So it's not going to be X and Y in this one. It's going to be A and B. Okay, so you need to pay attention to that. So over here, my output, which is B, is equal to a times negative 3 because that's what I was doing for each of those that can be written as B equals negative 3 a so that's what you should have got for your rule okay so that's full let's fill that in over here okay so that's our rule over there now we need to use that rule to work out our output value over here. So if our input is 3, we get b equals negative 3 times 3, and that is negative 9. So our output value over there is negative 9. And then this input over here is negative, uh, our output, sorry, is negative 30 we have to work out our input, okay? So negative 3 times what is negative 30? Negative 3 times 10 is negative 30. So therefore, A must be 10. So our input over here must be 10. And that's what you should have got for each of those. And that, how, that is how we work with flow diagrams. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.